Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Lezak, Coordinator of Special Projects with the Adult Services Department. And on behalf of everyone at the Chicago Public Library, welcome. Tonight's program is part of the 2020 One Book, One Chicago season, exploring the theme Beyond Borders and the book Exit West by Mohsen Hamid. For more information on other virtual programs, including book discussions, author events, workshops, and more, visit onebookonechicago.org. Thanks to the Chicago Public Library Foundation, Bank of America, Union Pacific, and United Airlines for their support in making this season of One Book, One Chicago possible. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by CPL's Latinx Heritage Committee and presented in honor of Latinx Heritage Month, and we are thankful for their support in making tonight's happen. During tonight's program, we'll be monitoring the chat for questions from the audience for our Q&A following the performance, so please feel free to ask one. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome Jose Torres Tama, aliens, immigrants, and other evildoers playwright to the CPL virtual stage. A little bit about Jose. Ecuadorian-born Jose Torres Tama is a published poet and playwright, an arts educator, cultural activist, and visual and performance artist. He explores the underbelly of the North American dream mythology and the post 9-11 blind nationalism that has led to rampant anti-immigrant hysteria gripping the United States of amnesia, which seduces you to embrace forgetting. Among many grant awards, he's received a prestigious MAP fund for his Taco Truck Theater Teatro Sin Fronteras Ensemble Project on Wheels that challenges the criminalization of immigrants and the parallel historical struggles of African Americans with continuous killings of unarmed Black civilians by white police. This Taco Truck Kills Fascists is the documentary film on his Theater on Wheels project, and it won Best Louisiana Feature at the 2018 New Orleans Film Festival. Tonight's program, Aliens, Immigrants, and Other Evildoers, is his sci-fi Latino noir performance solo that exposes the rise in hate crimes against immigrants, dehumanized by the same system that readily exploits their labor. Aliens has sold out a 200-seat theater at Vanderbilt University, and his fall 2019 solo out shows in Houston, New Orleans, and Los Angeles. Northwestern University Press has published the full performance script of Aliens in a 2019 book entitled Encuentro, New Latinx Performances for the American Theater, and this anthology brings together six contemporary Latinx playwrights work. From 2006 to 2011, Torres Tama contributed commentaries to NPR's Latino USA that explored the many challenges of Latino immigrant workers in post-Katrina New Orleans. His forthcoming book, Hard Living in the Big Easy, Immigrants and the Rebirth of New Orleans, documents the human rights violations experienced by immigrant reconstruction workers who have given their blood, labor, and love to resurrect a devastated port city from its critical condition in the immediate years post-storm. Again, following the performance tonight, we'll have a chance to talk to Jose about the show, so please leave your questions in the chat. Now, sit back, relax, and enjoy Aliens, Immigrants, and Other Evildoers. Ooh. Hola, Chicago. Ooh. Mi gente de Pilsen, I hope you're out there. I was there in Pilsen last year presenting this show live at the National Museum of Mexican Art. So here we go. I'm ready for my Zoom close-up. Are you ready? Ladies and gentlemen, damas y caballeros, enchiladas y burritos. I went down to St. James Infirmary. So my caramel brown baby there, she was an undocumented immigrant worker. She had cleaned out the Superdome and convention center, but nobody, nobody, nobody was there to cry for her. Sin papeles se murió trabajando por una miseria de dólares, su sudor y su sangre regalando. She was living in a parallel universe, in a bizarre science fiction reality, ubiquitous and invisible simultaneously, reconstructing the city that care and Bush forgot. But like much of her brown Latino family, her pain and suffering doesn't mean a lot to the likes of you and you and gringos generally. Era una mujer mestiza invisible, 
para los blancos en general, como mucha de su gente indocumentada, sufriendo en la plena oscuridad, aguantando brutalidad policial y deportaciones de la pinche inmigración sin comida y sin casa se encontraba combatiendo tristeza y soledad en la calle se murió abandonada en un país donde sobre el dinero y la libertad I went down to St. James Infirmary my body overcome by grief but I am here to tell her story. And those of my brown paper back people because it's my, my destiny. After seeing my caramel brown baby there dead at St. James Infirmary, I went down to the river and cried some more. With tears, I plotted this performance for her revenge. I went down to St. James Infirmary because I create from pain, ooh, ooh, another version for the lexicon, ow, ooh, after a version like that, after an opening like that, I need a drink, ow, and since I'm from New Orleans, you know, and I'm right here coming to you live into your Chicago soon, I bring my own, but first, here we go, we do a petition to Elewa, pide la Elewa, Elewa at the crossroads. Ashe, Oshun, Yemaya, U, Ashe. Hey! Woo! Fire water. I don't even know what's in there anymore, but it's good. Está rico y suave como yo. Ow! You know, um, I feel a little green. I feel a little alien green. I feel a little extraterrestrial green. I feel a little my favorite Martian green. Green, I feel a little alien green, extraterrestrial green. My favorite Martian green, supposedly illegal with the green card. Undocumented green, distrustful snake green, odious, adulterous, thespian green, broccoli of the many meals we pick for you green. Guacamole, you can't live without green. Jalapeno, revolution, here we come green. Green of your painful greenbacks that we earn with our green veins flush because of our resilient cactus green spirit that will boycott the Arizona venom green instead of law that leaks the pus green of infected minds and polluted bariacid green souls. But I know not all you green, not all you green, not all you green goes hate like that, like that green greed that exploits immigrant labor and our green alien vulnerability as endangered as the swamp green of Louisiana. Threatened by British Petroleum logo green, black oil spill, transforming the green blue waters of the Gulf into a Greenpeace emergency with their putrid lies, with their putrid lies that the oil has disappeared into the green ecosphere just like that. I caramba, ow! Bienvenidos to the hemispheric Americas, to a borderlessitos without NSA security supervision, without Fox propaganda television, and without those vigilante Minutemen whose desperate housewives must be longing for Latino interjections. Hmm. Maybe that's why they call themselves the Minutemen in the first place. Hunting down Latinos because we last longer than Duracell. Hmm. And the energizer the bunny ain't got nothing on my people's persistence because we, we keep on going and going and going and crossing and crossing and crossing every day, every hour to reclaim what was ours in the first place. Google the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty of 1848. Google the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty of 1848 and you will discover that the Northern territories of Mexico from Texas to California, Oklahoma, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, uh, were appropriated by Uncle Sam's hunger to manifest imperial destiny. Ow! Google your history, baby. Yes, to manifest imperial destiny. And the rightful Mexican landowners became a subjugated underclass. Mm -hmm. Segregated the way they did in the Deep South with Jim Crow laws, but in the Southwest, it was Juan Crow laws. Segregated and English, the first language. Spanish was broken on the backs of every Mexican Latino child forbidden to speak it. I 
caramba! ¡Au! Así que venimos con las pilas puestas, canales. Y esto es un espacio experimental, sin fronteras, sin la pinche migra y sin esos pendejos supuestamente patriotas patrullando nuestros sueños con sus pesadillas de odio. There's no translation for that. <laughs> uh, but the latest statistic show, but the latest statistic show, but the latest statistic show that salsa sauce outsells Heinz ketchup as the leading condiment every year. Mm. And guacamole junkies ow, are learning how to tango by the millions. Ooh, and Gringolandia, Gringolandia is obsessed with tanning, but don't brown too much, my amigo friends, or you'll experience the bitter sweet surrender of a marginalized existence. If you have a permanent suntan, speak with an accent and visit Arizona with a green card or a passport. Ooh, verde, como me siento, verde, extraterrestre, verde, si mi tarjeta, verde, que supuesta, mente, me marca como verde, ilegal. Uh, uh, I feel a little black and blue and green, extraterrestrial, my favorite, Martian green, supposedly illegal, with a green card, undocumented, here to stay green, like the first illegal aliens, pilgrims green, since the pilgrims, since the pilgrims, since the pilgrims arrived without papers, why, why were they not? Supported with Columbus and his three ships. They, the Europeans, the Europeans were the first illegal aliens in the hemispheric Americas. Take that to the bank. Baby, darling, boo, who, you. Ow! And you, and you, and you. And you, you Agent Orange of Chaos. You Agent Orange of Chaos. You Agent Orange of Chaos. With your orange comb over, pimping hate and fear. With your orange comb over, hiding the many burning crosses on fire that ignite to fewer, fever of pitch. Every time you give a little speech to make America hate again, you and your deplorable minions with previous Jefferson Beauregard Sessions. Let's remember that name, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions, named after presidents and generals of the Confederacy. Jefferson Beauregard Session, that odious senator, yes, who's a living monument to the Confederacy, who scripted into law your zero tolerance policy, baby, your zero tolerance policy, where children are jailed in cages. Mm. Let's make sure we don't forget that just because we have the COVID scare that children are still dying at those border concentration camps. Oh, no, wait, wait a minute. It, it can't happen here. It's happening right here, baby, right here in your beacon of democracy. Mm -hmm. This is not fake news. It's not alternative facts. Ow! And let's dare to remember that not only do we have children in cages, but COVID is spreading. And your so-called compassionate border guards have told mothers to quench their thirst by drinking toilet water. Ow! It can't happen in here. It's happening right here, baby, in the so-called beacon of democracy. Because the United States of Amnesia seduces you to embrace forgetting that the so-called beacon of democracy was founded on the near extermination and near genocide of indigenous native people. Ow! Yes! Uh, and the lands were stolen transformed into private property. Oh, baby, let's say to remember. So when you celebrate Thanksgiving up, coming up during this holiday, let's say to remember you become an accomplice because I'm a vegetarian and I don't slaughter turkeys the way they do across this land, millions of turkeys to celebrate the near genocide extermination of native people and call it a national holiday, a day of giving thanks. Meanwhile, you watch black athlete football players in college playing their hearts out and you don't even dare to take a knee for them. No, baby. Come on now. Come on now. The United States of Media seduces you to embrace forgetting that these stolen lands, that the empire was built by the enslavement of Africans. Mm. African men, women, and children, African beings, and their bodies transformed into private property. The same the land, the same way the land was transformed into private property. So let's get to remember, baby, because the United States of Amnesia seduces you to embrace forgetting. But let me tell you something. It's the job of the artist. Ow! It's the job of the artist. Ow! It's the job of the artist to, to remember, to remember the people's story 
as opposed to the official lies of government. You, and in my universe, in my universe, you, you agent orange of chaos, no human being is illegal. No human being is illegal. No human, no human, no human being is illegal. Ningún ser humano es ilegal. 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 No human being is illegal. No human being is illegal. No tengo paciencia para gente sin conciencia. No tengo paciencia para gente sin conciencia. I got no patience now for people without consciousness. I got no patience now for people without consciousness. So you, you agent orange of chaos, you agent orange of chaos, pimping hate and fear with your orange coma over hiding the many burning crosses on fire that ignites a fever of fever of pitch every time you give another speech to make America hate again. You, in my universe, there's no guacamole for immigrant haters, no guacamole for immigrant haters, no guacamole for immigrant haters, and you, Pimping hate and fear. You, Agent Orange of Cast, you can't even go near the chips. Oh, Ow. That is what we call a performance opening. Oh, my goodness. Ow. All right, people, all of you out there in Chicago, Landia, maybe some of you in Pilsen, if you have some tequila next to you, take a shot right now, baby. Take a shot right now because. That was the opening scene. And I'm gonna just transform myself right in front of your very eyes. Ooh. Because this is a Zoom Without Borders performance, darling. Así que my bello people out there, mi gente, mi gente, supuestamente out there. Ooh. Here we go. And just because I use my voice in such extraneous ways, un poquito de agua, a little bit of water. So after that shot of tequila, take a little bit of water just for your throat. Here we go as the program continues. Yo, yo soy un inmigrante. También, también con la piel de otra tierra lejana de Sudamérica, del Ecuador, de Guayaquil. Y yo crucé con mi madre, con mi madre por avión, por avión, escapando un padre malechero, egoísta, abusivo. Y por eso no había solución más que cruzar como inmigrante, como inmigrante, como inmigrante que cruza por varias razones. The immigrant crosses for various reasons, for economical necessity, for the dream of a better life, to avoid political persecution, to escape economical despair, because the act of crossing is a physical poem. It's a mythic scream. It's a rebellious undertaking because those are colonial scars on the back of our Pachamama Tierra, Mother Earth. And mothers and children are crossing supposedly into the beacon of democracy, supposedly into the beacon of democracy, only to be dehumanized, only to be called illegals, only to be called aliens. Let's stand to remember that coming up right now sometime in December it will mark the 400 years since the pilgrims arrived at Plymouth Rock let's make sure we understand who the actual immigrants are I was born in South America and raised in New York City of North America I am more American than most of you and I'm also part Quechua native so we the hemispheric people the hemispheric people of the Americas we have been migrating now we have to contend with your colonial scars and sometimes sometimes the border the border crosses you because sometimes the border, porque a veces la frontera te cruza a ti. 
Así que el sueño de cruzar siempre sabe más que tú. El sueño de cruzar siempre sabe más que tú. I said the dream. The dream knows more. I said the dream knows more than you. Uh, porque a veces la frontera te cruza a ti. Because sometimes the border crosses you. I arrived in the United States at the tender age of seven with my mother. She was brave enough to make a leap from Ecuador, South America to New York City with just a suitcase full of hope, her only child, and barely a few words in English to negotiate our passage. It was September 1968, and we made our entry to the port of Miami. As we were held for customs inspection at that port, at that airport, we were told that sacrifices needed to be made to enter the kingdom, to enter the land of all, all opportunity. My first reality jolt came when my two last names were severed from each other because of a rather incomprehensible appetite for abbreviation in this English only world dominated by monosyllabic name combinations such as John Smith, Bob King, Tom Jones. My full and more melodic birth name of Jose Eduardo Torres Tama was reduced to Jose Torres in the Southern vernacular. It was a butchering, it was a butchering, it was a butchering. It was a metaphor, it was a metaphoric butchering. It was a metaphoric butchering, it was a butchering of a metaphoric umbilical cord connecting me. It was a butchering of a metaphoric umbilical cord. It was a butchering of a metaphoric umbilical cord connecting me, connecting me to the ghost of all my dead relatives left behind. It was a butchering of a metaphoric umbilical cord and I was reduced to Jose Torres. Now, if you looked up Jose Torres in the New York phone book back then, in those white pages, you would see thousands of us stuck together because of a very common Spanish first name and the last one just as popular, Jose Torres. Now, if you know, if you yell out Jose in a Latin ex-Mexican uh, neighborhood, like if you yell out Jose in Pilsen, half the neighborhood turns around. Do you know that? If you yell out Maria, the other half turns around. Jose, Maria, vente a comer. I was reduced to Jose Torres and I became a permanent resident alien. We were given a green card to go with the motif of being an alien. Now, you have to understand that being an alien is challenging. I often have to leave my antennas at home because they scare people. And it gets a little clumsy, especially when I walk into libraries through those uh, doors, you know, and I have to try to position myself so the metal detector doesn't go off. But now, in the digital age, I no longer need the antennas. NSA, National Security Agency, has just planted a chip in the back of my neck just to make sure they can keep tabs on my subversive performance activities because they have heard, they have heard that I am an agent from Her Majesty's Secret Salsa Service with a license to transport subversive performance art across state lines, international waters, and now cyber borders. Oh my goodness. <laughs> now I have to say that with that digital chip, whenever I travel, like when I'm in New York, I get a little HBO. I do. Now, when I was in LA and I was in downtown LA, interestingly enough, I got a Disney Channel hookup. Some jokes I do just for me. Now you too can play alien uh, if you saved any of those rabbit ears back in your homes, but you know, you might just go all the way digital.
So now, take another moment. Take another shot of tequila if you have it. I'm going to take another shot of water for the next movement. Yo me sentía como un monstruo. I feel like a monster, like an alien. I come to New Orleans, September 2005. They bring many immigrants in to reconstruct. Meanwhile, they keep the community out into exile. I come in and you have to understand that it was like being in an apocalyptic movie, what you call those apocalypse dystopian films. There was nobody there. Houses destroyed, the smell of death everywhere. El olor de la muerte por todo lado. No había ni gente. No más había los obreros, nosotros, los contratistas, los patrones y la Guardia Nacional. All that was there was us, the Latin, Latino worker people, reconstructing everything, pulling cadavers out of the Superdome. And then your National Guards and the contractors. And they paid us what they promised early on, but then slowly they started to not pay us the promised wages. And I'm there in September 2006. And now this happened to me. I'm waiting on a corner like everybody else, and you have to understand what laborers, when we work, when we wait for work out in front of Home Depot or Lowe's, we risk so much. One man come over, he said, two people he want, Tomas quería dos personas. He point to me, my compadre, we go with him. We go with him to begin, uh, he put us in his truck to begin taking out all this garbage, this smell, this poison, putrid garbage. And you have to understand the contractors don't give us proper equipment. No nos dan ni máscaras. I only walk in with my sneakers and the water is up to our knee, dirty water, contaminated. My friends, they get sick, but we do this work. And we start pulling out all of this putrid smelling furniture. And then the contractor, he says, he wants us to move this dumpster. This dumpster, que pesa una tonelada, que la muevan cerca de la casa, that we move it closer to the house. And he gives us this little jack to begin moving. We have no choice, so we begin trying. So we begin moving, trying to lift. I'm trying to lift and then My compadre, he say, I'm screaming like an animal. The jack slips, the dumpster is crushing my hand. I could feel it cutting, cutting this blood everywhere in the rame de sangre. The contractor does nothing, no hace nada. My friend, fortunately, he have a phone. He calls for an ambulance. He calls and then immediately trying to help me. He's trying to lift with this jack and we pulled my hand out after five minutes of being crushed. Mi mano está totalmente destruida. Está cortada en dos. Hay un derrame de sangre. My hand is cut in two. There's blood everywhere. 
I am bleeding. Ambulance comes, takes me to hospital. The nurses and doctors, they never see anything like this. My hand is, my arm is blown up. They say we have to cut your left arm to protect from infection. And I'm thinking, como así, yo vine acá a este país a trabajar, ahora regreso a Honduras sin un brazo. How I come here from Honduras and now I go back without an arm. Pero hubo un milagro, there was a miracle. African-American man, un señor afroamericano que era him being, he was a chief surgeon, head doctor there. He said, no, we not cut your arm. I am 19 years old at this moment. He said, no, it's too traumatic. He tells me he has a son the same age. This kind man, he looked at me and he felt something for me. He connected to me. This black man said, I reminded him of his son. He was not going to cut my arm. He told all the nurses there, the doctors, that they will reconstruct my hand. I spent three months there, five surgeries. And you have to understand that this man saved me. El me ayudó, he saved my hand, reconstructed it and saved my arm. And you could think whatever you want, but the white nurses and doctors, they wanted to cut off my arm. They did not see me as a human being. They just wanted to cut my arm. They didn't have to consider that. This doctor, he saved me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And our people have suffered so much in the arms and nobody will tell you. Right now, we are suffering of COVID. It's spreading. I hated being dirty. And they would put us, they said they had housing. No, housing. They put 17 men, 17 hombres. They put 17 of us in a trailer for one people. I hate it being dirty. And now ICE agents are terrorizing. They've been terrorizing us. And they're abusive. Están abusando de nuestra gente en esos centros de detención. They're abusive or our people in those detention jails. We are being disappeared on the streets. And now there are even history books. This book, this published by the Louisian Endowment for the Humanities, a state arts agency, has disappeared us as if we did not even exist. And this book is in libraries all over this city. It's in the libraries of schools, grammar schools, high schools, and colleges all over the state. 300 year anthology. And we have disappeared because white scholars have the power to make us invisible. I have to be careful with that book because I borrowed it from the public library here in New Orleans. It's true, they lent it to me. We have to tell our own story. If we don't tell our own story, we will be disappeared. We will be forgotten. We have to tell our own story. Tenemos que contar nuestros propios cuentos. We have to tell our own story. Tenemos que contar nuestros propios cuentos.
Attention, please. Attention, please. Attention, please. Attention, please. We are under orange alert. Attention, please. Attention, please. We are under orange alert. Please wear your orange alert underwear at all times. Attention, please. Attention, please. Please make sure you wear your seat belts at all times, even when walking the dog. Attention, please. Attention, please. Attention, please. Para escuchar ese mensaje en español, oprime el número dos. You see, I'm telling you, them Latin people, they got you talking that Spanish everywhere you go. Yes, you go to that Taco Bell, and what do you got to do? You got to order a quesadilla. Yeah, you see, they got you talking that Spanish. I'm telling you, and then you go to Starbucks, and what do you got to do? You got to order a grande. Why can't they just call it big? That's what it is. They, you got, they got you talking that sexy Spanish. You call it grande and they charge you grande dólares. They charge you $7 for that mocha java cappuccino coming from I don't know where, maybe Colombia. I'm telling you, they got you talking that Spanish everywhere you go. That's the way them Latino people get you. And you know what's happening? They're having a lot of that caliente sex. They are. And apparently they're growing in cultural and electoral demographic power. I don't know what that means, but I know it's not good, right? Them Hispanics, you know why? Because they make me panic. And I'm telling you, some of them come in all kinds of colors. My, my next door neighbor, I knew, him, I knew him as Peter, right? And all of a sudden Obama put in that Bienvenidos to Havana going on, right? And people go there and then all of a sudden Peter decided to become Pedro. He said, that's his real name. And he's like fair skin, brown hair, and you know, reddish hair, he's from Miami, right? And then he said he was having a, a Bienvenidos to Havana party and all his neighbors came. They all came. And some of, not only his neighbors, some of his family, his cousins, some of them were black. And he told me they were Afro-Cuban. I was like, damn, they're black and Latino. That's scary. Black and Latino people. That's like Roberto Clemente all over again. Esoteric baseball reference number 35. I'm telling you, them Latino people, they're, they're coming out. And you know what he did? That Peter, he became Pedro. He came out of the Cuban closet. And you know there's a Cuban closet out there. And they come out of that. I'm telling you, them Latino people, but that Jennifer Lopez, mm, 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 she's a fine quesadilla and she's not even Mexican. I hear she's Puerto Rican, but I'm telling you, them Latino people, they're growing and they're, and they're gonna take over very soon. Mark my words. They're saying 2050, I think it's tomorrow. Orange alert. I'm telling you, it's orange alert. Ooh, el orange alert vato, no? Wow, that vato scares me. Did you see that vato? That's like a, a redneck intervention, no? Orale, he just body snatched the whole performance, no? Orale, they call me, they call me el pachuco of interracial interplanetary love of the future because there's a lot of hate out there, no? There's a lot of hate. Yes, we need more love. We need interracial love. Yes. And this is my new outfit. Check out this outfit, no? Ow! You can't even see it, but I got some killer shoes on, no? But check out this outfit. Ow! This is my new outfit for my new HBO show called Latino Eye for the White Guy. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's where I offer the seductive measures of Latino lovers. to those clueless white boys. You know, you've seen them walking around in those Birkenstock sandals with their foot and all that fungus on their toes. No, I got one word for that. That's the next, kill that, no. No, walking around with the white privilege. And you know what really worries me? And sometimes when I'm going live, I say, you know what worries me? And people say, Pachuco, what worries you? And it worries me when I hear politicians say, let's take America back. And I'm like, how far back do you wanna go? 1950 was not a good time for anybody. Not even a good time to be a white woman in 1950. Not a good time to be gay. Not a good time to even be a Jewish filmmaker in Hollywood. Elia Kassan, Google it. No, I'm not just dropping names, no. And I'm not giving out any names. No, not a good time to be American, Native, Indian, 
anywhere in this country. Not a good time to be Chicano in the Southwest. Not a good time to be Puerto Rican in the Northeast. And not even a good time to be a Cuban in Miami. And certainly not a good time to be African-American colored Negro in the deep South with all those ubiquitous lynchings. And they seem to resemble the killings daily of unarmed black citizens by white police. Ow! The more it changes, the more it remains the same, no? And the deportations are so brutal. Yes. Have you heard? You know, you don't see the Taco Bell Chihuahua anymore, right? Remember him? Yo quiero Taco Bell. Yo quiero Taco Bell. Yo quiero Taco Bell. Yes, the Taco Bell Chihuahua. He was teaching you all Spanish. All you gringos out there, he was teaching you Spanish before Cory Booker and Beto O'Rourke. I would vote for that little Chihuahua when he was on an independent ticket, no? Yes. Well, I'm going to break it down for you. It's going to come out on CNN soon. They caught that little Chihuahua. He was in LA. He was living off his retirement because you have to understand that was that little Chihuahua's dream. His Coyote cousins, they crossed him across the border when he was just a little baby Chihuahua. They crossed him across the border and he lived out his dream because he saw in the LA Times, he saw a posting for a job for Taco Bell and he went there and he killed it. No, he was, yo quiero Taco Bell, yo quiero Taco Bell, yo quiero, he killed that. Yeah, that audition, and now he was retiring and the Taco Bell Chihuahua had become a vegetarian. Yes, I'm not making this up. He got caught in a subway raid by ICE agents in Boyle Heights in Los Angeles. Yes, he was ordering a six, I think it's one of the, the they called the foot long subway sandwich, you no, know, the veggie one. And the Miga came in, they raided, they raided the subway sandwich spot. And then they deported him. He's a Chihuahua and they deported him. He's a Chihuahua from Chihuahua, Mexico, but they deported him all the way to Oaxaca. What's a, what's a Chihuahua? from Chihuahua gonna do in Oaxaca. He's gonna have to take a Greyhound bus and they don't even have buses there, no? Así que, all you people, you know, you love the food, right? You know, I know. Así que, al fin en los oídos, despierten a su conciencia y ajusten sus cinturones filosóficos. Do not be afraid, amigos y amigas, porque se habla español aquí. Do not be afraid of the Spanish language because tostitos are here to stay. In fact, we are new and improved, fat-free, and good for the economy. So if you're a bilingual challenge, sharpen your ears, awake your subconscious, and adjust your philosophical seatbelts because it's still early in the new millennium of the 21st century. Así que, America, as in Central and South America as well. Yes, because it's the hemispheric America's vatos. And if you don't know, if you don't know, like right now, this character that Jose is performing, he's a he loves the, the work of Luis Valdez, the Chicano godfather of theater. And this is his his way to honor him because Jose, he's an Ecuadorian performance artist. That's a lonely club of one. He's also a Latino vegetarian. That's a contradiction in terms. But if you want to know about Luis Valdez, Google it. Because Latinos, we love to Google. I love to say Google. Google, 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 Google. No, because Google is actually a Latin term. Actually, to be honest with you, Google is an old Aztec term from the Aztec goddess. Google gets it quietly, which means look shit up and say, know your history in the United States of amnesia. Ow! So. Do not be afraid of the Spanish language. Adjust your philosophical seatbelts. Awake your subconscious. Because we are here to stay. And we are new and improved. We are fat free and good for the economy. So if you are bilingually challenged, sharpen your ears, awake your subconscious and adjust your philosophical seatbelts because you know you love the food. You know you love your huevos rancheros on Sunday brunch and you pay $25 for that and then you get a little avocado on toast. No, right? You love your pupusas from El Salvador. You love your ceviche from Ecuador, but you can't just love the food and dehumanize the cooks. No, vato. There's no guacamole for immigrant haters. So you out there, remember, America, wake up in North America. Let's get yourself woke. Wake up and smell the cafe con leche. And on next election Tuesday, vote Republican fear out to graze in a medieval pasture. Orale. That's the end of the show, canalitos. Ow!
Thank you so much, Jose. That was fantastic. We have some questions from the audience that they have sent in. So we'll, uh, we, we'll ask you a few. And anyone who wants to put a question in the chat, go ahead. We have a few minutes to talk to with Jose about his show and his work. Um, first question is, you make a parallel between immigrants and aliens from outer space. I like how you use sci-fi as a way to make that point. How did you get that idea? Are you a sci-fi fan? I'm a big sci-fi fan. I love Star Trek, but let's remember that Rod Serling of the Twilight Zone was very an amazing writer, and I used to be addicted to those little sh those shows. I used to watch them. Uh, you know, I used to go late at night and watch them. Um, and remember, he was always very socially conscious. And sci-fi, like even Ray Bradbury, they were able to deal with socially conscious issues masked in the science fiction. Same way with Star Wars, if you remember, not, not Star Wars, but more than anything, Star Trek. If you remember, it created it created tremendous, you know, discourse and outrage when you had white Captain Kirk kissing Ohura, right? Lieutenant Ohura, right? So, and that speaks to you about this, the lingering racial challenges in this country. So yes, I love sci-fi. When you actually see the full sci-fi show, we have a whole scroll, we have a whole matrix. Uh, we, we pull the sci-fi films and we, you know, we satirize them. And you have to understand that I was given a green card, right? It goes with the theme, the sci-fi green. I was called the permanent resident alien as opposed to those temporary aliens, you know, walking around. So I was already called an alien. So it, it came to me a number of years ago. In fact, it was right after George Bush. And, you know, I always saw Bush as a cross between like Por Porky Pig and Yosemite Sam, you know, and he, and he said like, uh, we're gonna get them evil doers. <laughs> And uh, I thought, oh my God, evildoers. So I came up right afterwards when he said that aliens, immigrants, and other evildoers. And I began exploring that sci-fi aspect. Uh, we also have a sort of a related question about just your process. Um, you use humor to make points about very serious matters. Why did you choose satire as your medium? Satire is the best. I mean, you know, like, um, so I'm a big fan of stand-up comedy, like that Dave Chappelle. He goes into deep territory. And you have with George Collin, Richard Pryor, who dealt a lot of with racial issues, right? When they speak to these issues and they seduce you, humor is a seductive measure. If you laugh, we all collectively laugh, we begin to open doors and we cross those borders and we cross those fearful borders because you say, some of them are saying, I damn them not no person, he's talking some, he's talking some stuff. Right, you see that happened. I got that uh, Agent Orange body snatcher. So I have to use humor because I need the humor as much as you need the humor because this is some very deep work. I mean, this is contemporary work about one of the most challenging issues right now. And it's nothing new, right? Let's make sure we understand that this has been happening. You've had Chinese Exclusion Act. Come on, Chinese Exclusion Act, Indian Removal Act. Pachuco, when he goes on, he goes, Indian Removal Act. Oh, they weren't even trying to be subtle. They could have called it Operation Iraqi Freedom, no? Some jokes I do just for me, right? So uh, humor allows us to be able to go into darker and deeper, more provocative territory. Um, your characters are so great that you do throughout the show. And somebody asked, uh, who inspired the characters in the show? Is it people you know, people you've seen? Um, how, how do you get the ideas for your characters? Very good question. They're all very good questions, by the way. So I'm deeply grateful because it, it means that people are tuning in. So the Swamp Brujo, that's, uh, so I'm a big fan being living in New Orleans. Voodoo is very real, Yoruba, uh, Santeria practices. And I really migrated to them very quickly. In fact, this outfit, red and black, is uh, the colors of um, Elegua, Legba, right? So early on, I make a petition to open up the crossroads. I usually make that petition just so that, you know, things could go smoothly. But the Swamp Brujo character, if you ever see the movie Live and Let Die, there's a Baron Samdi character, right? He's normally wearing black, the top hat, and normally his colors are black and purple. But I change it to black and green, and that's more of a color of Shango, the warrior. But with the top hat, um, it transforms me, right? And I take early on, I, I bring in that almost growly voice of uh, St. James Infirmary by Louis Armstrong. And I transform the lyrics to that as an ode to the immigrant women. And then I go into that Baron Samdi character and you know, his voice changes a lot. Like green, I feel a little alien green, a little extraterrestrial green. And whenever I do that character, I feel a little Dr. Frankenfurter kind of sneaks in, you know, uh, from Rocky Horror Picture Show. So um, I wanted to make distinct characters like, you know, uh, 
the swamp brujo, right? Which brujo means the, the shaman, the witch doctor. And, and he's like showman, shaman, shyster. He opens it up, right? And he performs and then comes in my character with my personal voice, right? And then come in the Honduran character. And and I'm sure that some of you are wondering, is gonna, he going to keep that makeup all throughout? And then I go into that ritual where I spread that water to cover my face. And now you still have another mask, right? Because now it's the... It's sort of in many ways uh, exemplary of the way the alien, right? It's like the alien green worker. Right. Um, yeah. It, it, somebody asked, uh, how has it been for you transitioning to online and virtual performances rather than live, especially given that you're doing sort of a what, one man show and kind of by yourself? That's a very good question. Normally afterwards we would go out with Jennifer, maybe go to the restaurant, have a couple more shots of tequila, right? Uh, but it's challenging uh, for me simply because, yes, and also within the entire show, I'm crossing borders all the time. Immediately you understand that I know you there. I'm not a voyeuristic. Uh, I'm not waiting you to just be a, um, a passive voyeur, right? I'm engaging the audience all the time. So that's a big challenge. It's been a really big challenge. I, I just have to believe. And I think sometimes I go way out. I mean, I always, whenever I perform, I throw 250% down, but I find myself going, and now, you know, I've been performing so much that I've been trying to, you know, understand and, and use Zoom as a measure. I like it when you could do the things with the hands, right? And, and I'm a very physical performer and I've created the space and this back here, this is all the body, this is all my artwork from a recent exhibit that's gonna to be also touring to university galleries later. But yeah, it's a challenge. I just have to believe that you are receiving it the way I'm throwing it down. And uh, usually from the questions, it's, it means that you are receiving it well. Uh, we also have a question about that art in the background. Somebody said, I'm curious about the art in the background. Can you tell us about it? Absolutely. So I studied my, what I study is fine arts and creative writing, fine arts and poetry, right? So, but this is my, my, my work. My, uh, these are large works on paper. Um, and I received a, a couple of grants to be able to develop this body of work. Uh, it's called Hard Living in the Big Easy, Immigrants and Rebirth of Neons. They will be featured in the book that's forthcoming. I've been behind on the book. This one right here, this one right here is dedicated to uh, Felipe Alonso Gomez. He's the seven or eight year old Nicaraguan boy that died on Christmas Eve. Whew. I take a deep breath because it was very moving. He died on Christmas Eve in 2018. Uh, at one of the detention centers. And that's like a version of a Mestiza Brown Guadalupe Medana, right? And my work, as you could see, it's very, very much like what you have over there at the Chicago Museum. You know, the works of Diego Rivera have been very influential to me. The works of David Alfaro Siqueiros, the other Mexican murals, and Jose Clemente Orozco. We were supposed to perform with my larger project at the Detroit Institute of the Arts, my ensemble project. Um, this July, but of course the COVID lockdown wiped all of that away. So um, the artwork, making drawings was my first love. It still is my love. Poetry is my second love. And then I make my living by making the word become flesh, right? In performing the words. But yes, so I I've, I've decided to make this the backdrop to be able to give the, I, I believe that it gives the work a, a greater sense of energy because the work is there, right? And it's, and, and it's my hand that has drawn the, those uh, works on paper, those figures, the same way my hand has typed up the script, right? That's great. Um, I think we have one more question uh, before we end, but it's a doozy. What do you think is the role of the artist in times of struggle, like perhaps the ones that we are experiencing today? That's a very good question. Toni Morrison, shortly uh, after the election, put out um, the importance of the word of, of the role of the artist. The artist has to speak the people's truth as opposed to the official lies. The artist, I speak a lot about remembering. We have to remember because if you dare to remember, Bush the Elder uh, was the um, head of the CIA when just we just passed September 11. But September 11 in the 1974-76 was when uh, the United States and the CIA invaded. Uh, the democratic elected government of Allende and installed the brutal Pinochet dictator. And the United States has done a lot with the CIA. Just recently, a book came came out about all of the CIA uh, basically, you know, um, 
installments, all of the wars that they started, they supported Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. They supported other dictators in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Honduras. So when you have this great migration that you're still seeing now, it's because people are escaping the economical despair from the, these are the vestiges of those wars from the 70s, the 80s, you know, Central, uh, the Nicaraguan woman that I perform in the largest show speaks to that issue. Right, and we have to dare to remember that this is the legacy still in this country. Right, you can't just think that oh, you know, people go, well, why, why all them Mexicans in California? Oh my God, it used to be Mexico. Oh, I forgot about that conveniently. So we, the job of the artist is to remember. And you could look, you could find that quote by Toni Morrison, especially at times like this. It's the job of the artist not only to remember but to speak the people's truth and to make a clarion call, to call out the lies that exist. Upton Sinclair, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's one of the best. He said that the dictatorship in this country will come wrapped around in a flag. I'm just saying. And we have one more question before we end. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for being here. These are great questions. How do you keep writing amongst such dire, dire circumstances. Every day gives us more bad news. So what inspires you to keep writing and performing? Humanity. To be honest with you, I share this with, you know, um, Pachuco forgot to say it because normally he says, you know, no, love is radical. Hate is reactionary. This comes to you with love. I'm critical because I love, I love where I live. I love New Orleans. I have two boys and they're, and they're, you know, they're part Quechua, Ecuadorian, German, Irish, little gringos of the new millennium, right? They are my hopes and they are hybrids, right? Hybrids get a lot greater, greater much, right? But they are my hopes for this country. And I want to believe, I want to believe still, but we have to, it, the system wants us to be depressed and feel nihilistic. No, I can't do that. I got to figure out how to reach you, how to maybe move your heart a little bit, you know, how to engage and say, you know, you maybe we need to rethink this thing. But it's true. I mean, we're not the immigrants. We're not. We actually belong in the hemispheric Americas. Let's look at reverse anthropology. In the Southwest, people don't realize that they lynched entire families after the 1848 Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty, and they brought in German and Irish immigrants to help them displace the Mexican rightful landowners. And that's why you have one of the biggest, you know, I performed a lot in San Antonio and way back in the day, I was like, wow, they have a huge Oktoberfest. They have a huge Oktoberfest in San Antonio because of the German, the German people there. Let's not forget that, especially in Milwaukee with a lot of German people, the Germans, at one point were uh, castigated. They were looked upon poorly, especially after World War II, it wasn't a good thing to say you were German. So all of this continues to repeat itself. So I give you my work, I offer it to you with my heart and my hand. In Spanish, you say, con el corazón en mi mano. So, you know, I still write, I'm working on, I'm working on an actual one man stand up piece called No Guacamole from Gonna Haters. And it takes place in the near future in like 2025 when Latinos have taken over Gringolandia. And Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is the first Latina woman president. <laughs> well, we'll have to have you back to perform that one when it's done as well. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jose, for being here. We really appreciate you sharing your talent with us and the show it was wonderful. Thank you all for tuning in today. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Uh, we really appreciate the conversation. I want to remind you that we have Beyond Borders programming happening now through the end of December. So please go to onebookonechicago.org to find out other programs that might be coming up. Please go to your library, check out Exit West by Mohsin Hamid and participate in the program. And uh, thank you so much for being here. And for any of you that may be interested, I actually have these No Guac Holy Jeremy Grenadas t-shirts. I love that. <laughs> the, the, the orange alert, he was, supposed to go, he was supposed to say, you see, look what they got me doing. This is a blatant, shameless advertising. No guacamole for him going t-shirts. So uh, you can go to my website, si uh, my site. All you got to do is go Google no guac shirts and it comes up and you can purchase them and I'll get them sent to you. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. No I want to thank Leland uh, for the uh, technical assistance. It's great to share the work with you all in Chicago. I was there last year in the Windy City performing. I loved it. I had a great time. So I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you, and we we'll hope we'll have you in person sometime in hopefully the near future. Thank you for being here, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Cheers. Adios.